Psalm 19. For the choir director, a psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God and the expanse proclaims the work of his hands. Day after day they pour out speech. Night after night they communicate knowledge. There is no speech. There are no words. Their voice is not heard. Their message has gone out to the whole earth and their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens he has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming from his home. It rejoices like an athlete running a course. It rises from one end of the heavens and circles to their other end. Nothing is hidden from its heat. The instruction of the Lord is perfect, renewing one's life. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperienced wise. The precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad. The command of the Lord is radiant, making the eyes light up. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are reliable and altogether righteous. They are more desirable than gold, than than an abundance of pure gold, and sweeter than honey, dripping from a honeycomb. In addition, your servant is warned by them, and in keeping them there is an abundant reward. Who perceives his unintentional sins? Cleanse me from my hidden faults. Moreover, keep your servant from willful sins. Do not let them rule me. Then I will be blameless and cleansed from blatant rebellion. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, At the moment, my family is reading through the book of 1 Samuel after dinner. Uh, Reading through the beginning chapters, I keep getting shocked by something that I have read and know already to be true about human nature again and again. That is, I'm shocked by the unfaithfulness of those whom God has saved the constant turning away of those God has revealed himself to. A couple of nights ago we were reading that under Samuel the people had a moment of returning to the Lord. And so Samuel said, well, if you're serious, then you had better dedicate yourself to the Lord with all your heart and... Get rid of all the idols, the fake gods that you have been worshipping. And that's when I did a little double take. Wait, what? They had idols? The very people who God had revealed himself to, who had seen his power to save them over and over again, were worshipping idols? Well, this is scandalous. It shouldn't actually be surprising and when you have read the previous books in the Bible. As God himself said to Samuel in chapter 8, when they were asking for a king, they are doing the same thing to you that they have done to me since the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day, abandoning me and worshipping other gods. From the moment they were brought miraculously, amazingly, powerfully out of Egypt up to and beyond the moment in 1 Samuel when they asked for a king, God's people just wanted to be like everyone else. In the desert, we want the Egyptians' food. In the promised land, we want a king like our neighbours. We want to serve their gods. 
And so the Israelites would see the sun, feel its heat and power and say, we want to serve the Egyptian sun god. Or looking up in wonder at the bright stars, they would say, we want to worship Ashtoreth of the Canaanites. King David understood the nature of humankind and his people, the Israelites. As a shepherd, he knew that our inclination is to at best drift and at worst run away from God. So David wrote Psalm 19 and gave it to the choir director to direct corporate worship. In Psalm 19, David exhorts God's people to the right worship of God. Through revelation from God, his people learn what to see, what to hear, and what to say. In, verse, in the first six verses of Psalm 19, David realigns the focus of the Israelites so that they can see right. So that when they look at the power of the sun and the vastness of the heavens, indeed, when they look at anything in creation, they don't see beings or creatures worthy of worship, but rather signposts pointing to the Creator as the only one worthy of praise. But these are no mere signposts that can be missed, like that time a friend of mine at uni on driving from Armadale home to the Central Coast misread a sign and ended up in Dubbo by mistake. Uh, no, these are signs so loud and clear that though they have no voice, they are as good as shouting at us so that we cannot accidentally mistake their meaning. They declare and proclaim and pour out speech and communicate knowledge about the awesomeness, the majesty and glory and power of the one true God. And just in case you did miss the sign, like those pesky speed signs you sometimes miss as you're driving along the highway, they speak again and again, all the time and in every place. Day after day and night after night, their silent message goes out to the whole earth and to the ends of the world. Each day the sun, not a god to be worshipped, but a servant of the Creator, the Son, joyful as a groom and as determined as Usain Bolt, silently screams to all the earth of the majesty of God. This general revelation in nature about the glory of God has gone out to all humankind. But as we have seen with the Israelites and as we heard in our reading from Romans chapter 1, humankind sees, hears and rejects what creation has to say about God. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served something created instead of the Creator. And so David then points the Israelites towards the second revelation of God. That is, the way God has revealed himself specifically to the Israelites through Scripture, through his word. He tells them what to hear. In verses 7 and 8, David repeatedly uses synonyms to talk about the word of the Lord. The instruction, the testimony, the precepts, the command of the Lord. And notice that the word he uses for God changes from the impersonal God or El, the creator, to the Lord, Yahweh, of the covenant with Israel. Same God, different name. The Lord, who revealed his name to Moses as he prepared to bring the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt. The Lord, 
who appeared on Mount Sinai and gave his people his law. The Lord who called the Israelites out of all the nations to be his own people. We see in verse 7 that unlike the creation which is broken and groaning for the day of renewal, the instruction of the Lord is perfect. It is complete and without defect. It is whole and it is life-renewing. Furthermore, the testimony of the Lord is trustworthy. We who, like the rest of creation, are also broken and unable to fully and completely comprehend the word of the Lord, we can trust it to make us wise. Uh, I'm a school teacher and a parent, and I feel like so often when I give a child a rule or instruction to follow, all that they are thinking is, boring. And that is if they aren't actually saying it. We often think of rules as being restrictive and boring. But in verse 8, David tells us that the precepts or, or the rules of the Lord are are right, and they make the heart glad. Um, I'm a teacher, and I'm not a very mechanically minded person, and I also tend to be a bit lazy. Uh, So I don't always look after my machinery the way the manual says I should. Uh, But earlier this year, when Ironically, I was bored. I I decided to change the oil and clean the filter of my whippersnipper in line with the instruction manual. It's a great little book. It tells you everything. Uh, Afterwards, I started it up, and I can tell you that baby purred. If a machine could be happy, that whippersnipper was happy. And God's word is designed to make his people purr. Living life the way the creator intended makes a heart glad and the eyes light up. Uh, The pattern then breaks in chapter 9 where David doesn't describe the word but the fear of the Lord. Having revealed himself to the Israelites, the correct response is a holy reverential trust in the one who is perfect when we are not. Like Isaiah before the throne of God, our response to the holiness of God revealed in his word should be, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man or woman of unclean lips and live among a people of unclean lips, and because my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. David then sums up what the attitude of God's people should be to the word of the Lord. It is more desirable than gold and sweeter than honey. The Israelites should covet God's word in the way that they shouldn't covet their neighbor's possessions. The word of God is how God's people both uh, know both the wisdom and salvation of God, making it both precious and sweet. In verses 11 to 14, the focus again shifts to the individual's response to the revelation of God, and David teaches his people what to say. David, the king, the man after God's own heart, uh, on being confronted with the awesomeness and holiness of God, revealed in in creation and the scriptures, is humbled. He recognises that he is but a servant who needs the encouragement of both the stick and the carrot to keep the Lord's commands. In addition, your servant is warned by them, and in keeping them there is abundant reward. When confronted with the revelation of God, David realises that he is sinful and ignorant. 
The comparison between his reality and the expectations of God are stark. David understands that he is so sinful, that he is so far below the mark of his creator, that he doesn't even always know when he is sinning. See in verse 12, Who perceives his unintentional sins? Cleanse me from my hidden faults. David knows that he is ignorant, but also understands that ignorance is not an excuse or defence. God, as revealed in his word, is so holy that his people even need cleansing from accidental and unknown sin. And if unintentional sin needs to be repented of and cleansed, then how much more deliberate sin? Despite the clear and constant revelation of God, David knows that, like all people, his inclination, his nature, is to reject God. In fact, unless God personally intervenes, then David knows that willful sin will rule him. David knows that somehow, miraculously, despite his own blatant rebellion against the true and good and glorious king, God can make him blameless and clean. In response to the revelation of God in nature and in scripture, in response to the knowledge that he himself does not measure up but needs God's intervention, David's prayer is that his own words and heart might be acceptable to his perfect God. We know that David wrote Psalm 19 and that it was for the choir director, for the worship of God. We know too that Jesus sang Psalm 19. Um, Now I couldn't find any examples of Jesus explicitly quoting Psalm 19 the way he quotes, say, Psalm 22 on the cross. But we know that Jesus, the man, the Israelite, lived as and participated in the customs of God's people. This undoubtedly would have included singing Psalm 19 as part of temple or synagogue worship. But more than guessing that he sang it, we can see in his words and actions that he knew Psalm 19 to be true and relied on the truth that it teaches. When Jesus was tempted in the desert, what was his defence against the devil? It was scripture, the revealed word of the Lord. Three times Satan tried to get Jesus to turn away from the will of God the Father, and three times Jesus turns to scripture to rebuke Satan. After not eating for 40 days, it was the nourishment of the word of God that Jesus desired instead of bread. The word of God that renewed his strength and made him wise to resist temptation. Time and again, when Jesus was challenged and tested by men, when the religious experts tried to trap him in sin, he was able to deftly and wisely do what was right. So that when they arrested him, they had to make up reasons and bring false witnesses in order to have him killed. And his total, complete understanding of the word of God meant that he never sinned, either intentionally or unintentionally. And because he never sinned, he was perfect, and because he was perfect, his death was an acceptable sacrifice, an offering to cover the sins of the whole world. Jesus is both the natural and the special revelation of God to humankind. Um, in Hebrews 1, and we, we said part of that earlier in our service, um, I'd say it's a coincidence, but with God there's no coincidences. In Hebrews 1, he is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature. 
And in John chapter 1, Jesus is the word who became flesh and took up residence among us. He is the only one whose words and heart meditations were always completely acceptable to God. He is the great bridegroom whose joy it was to fulfil the scriptures that he might call us and save us, his church, his bride, to be a holy people set apart for himself. He is the one whose joy it was to teach, to explain the scriptures to a people who are like sheep without a shepherd. He is the one who, like the sun which blazes over the entire earth, sends out his followers that his message might go out to the whole world, to the ends of the earth. Jesus is Psalm 19 because he is the perfect, complete revelation of God to mankind. Emmanuel, God with us. And because Jesus is Psalm 19, we who are not God's people by birth can sing Psalm 19 too. When we look at the heavens, when we see wonders in creation, we can marvel at the awesome power and creativity and glory of our Saviour. But we can also look forward to something better, to when this fallen and broken creation will be renewed on the day that Jesus returns. Because of Jesus and the working of the Holy Spirit in us, we can read and understand the revealed word of God, the Bible, which, as Paul says in 2 Timothy 15, is able to give us wisdom for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. We experience the freeing, heart-gladdening, life-giving nature of the word of God fulfilled in Jesus on our behalf. Because of Jesus, we can understand the warning of the judgment that is coming and look forward to the rich and abundant reward of life forever with God, paid for by the blood of Jesus himself. Because of Jesus, when we sin, intentionally or not, we can, as the author of Hebrews says, approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. Because of Jesus and his death for us on the cross, we are cleansed from our blatant rebellion against God. We are made blameless when Jesus takes our sin on himself and gives us his righteousness in its place. So, let us sing Psalm 19 with confidence. Let us not be afraid of the ongoing secular debate between science, the study of nature, and religion. Psalm 19 tells us that there is no debate. Both nature and scripture are revelations to the world about the greatness of God. Both implore us to know God and his will for us. Let us sing Psalm 19 by taking seriously Jesus' great commission that disciples might be made in all the earth. This might be by praying about and for missions, giving money for mission or even going on mission. At the very least, we should, as Peter says, always be ready to give a defence to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. The words of the heavens proclaim God's glory. The words of God in the Bible proclaim his glory. Do your words and my words proclaim God's glory? Let us sing Psalm 19 with thankful hearts by devoting ourselves to reading the Bible, thankful because we can know God, because he has made himself known to us in nature, in scripture, and ultimately in Jesus.